Hi everyone, I am Shreya. Uh, I uh, work as a doctor fellow at Center for Wildlife Studies. Uh, Center for Wildlife Studies is a research organization uh, which is also involved in con conservation policy and education. And uh, uh, until 2020, we used to host public talks on the latest topics in wildlife science and conservation in our Bangalore office. Uh, due to the pandemic, we have instead been conducting series of webinars. We have so far 37 webinars. You can check them out in our YouTube profile. Uh, we cover various topics such as public health and zoonotic diseases, tigers and elephants, snake bites and biocaustic. And uh, if you wish to support our work, you can reach out to us uh, through outreach at the rate cwsindia.org or see uh, and or visit our website at cwsindia.org. Uh, with this, I will move to uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Benjamin Freeman. Uh, ben is a banting and uh, Biodiversity Research Center postdoctoral fellow in Dos Schultes Lab at the University of British Columbia. He has received his PhD from Cornell University in 2016. Uh, uh, central themes of his research include drivers of high species diversity in some areas, while uh, lower species diversity in others. And uh, he works on avian evolution and species ranges, ranges in light of climate change. Uh, now I'll move to uh, Dr. Uh, Krishna Priya Tamma. Uh, she, uh, Priya is an ecologist with interest in tropical ecology and evolution. Uh, during her PhD from National Center for Biological St Sciences in Bangalore, uh, she has looked at biogeography and macroecology of small mammals in the Indian subcontinent. After completing PhD, she has pursued uh, postdoctoral uh, research in Center for Ecological Studies in ISP uh, on forest sa savanna dynamics in Africa. Currently, her research focuses on monitoring forest resilience in Northeast India and avian frugivore community structure. Uh, with this, I will uh, straight move to our uh, webinar session. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Ben and Tamma both, uh, what got you interested in biogeography? Uh, I would like, uh, I mean, Ben, you, if you could go first. Yeah, uh, so thanks and, and thanks for inviting me to, to be here. And so so why am I interested in biogeography? I, I don't understand how you couldn't be interested in biogeography because to me, so to, to me what biogeography is, is that, okay, I'm sitting here uh, on my patio in Vancouver, BC, and it's, uh, it's it's 6 30 a.m so it's, it's dark here that's uh, I'm, I'm just huddled out here with my family sleeps um but if i drive 10 kilometers up into the mountains i start to see different plants and animals if i drive if i take the ferry and go to the islands there's different plants and animals and so this 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 thing that i think we see as humans which is that when we move across earth we see different things in different places even if the climate's very similar then to me, that's that's kind of the root of biogeography is trying to understand why things are different in different places, and you don't have to go across the world to see those differences. Although that that is also illustrative, uh, but but I think that's just totally fascinating and um, and is something that has always interested me, uh, and and I think that's that's the root observation. Like, okay, why are why does this thing why is this thing common here when it's doesn't even exist where I live, and it seems pretty similar to me. And then you start to realize, oh, there, there, there's, it's because of these differences, or it's because of these things, and or maybe we don't know. Uh, and I think so there's lots of lots of open questions in that in that biogeography. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is that so I, th I I feel like it's a very kind of curiosity driven thing for me. But then in the climate change era and in this anthrop anthropocene where humans are dominating the landscape some of these questions become really important if we want the plants and animals to persist into the foreseeable future. Uh, we, we, we start to need to know how they're gonna respond to changing conditions and whether they'll be able to persist or whether they might need management action and human help to persist. 
right yeah i think we all have certain i mean uh, places where we come for biography <laughs> like uh, like i first uh, saw I, i remember i was uh, first seeing a map a very colorful map of species distribution of uh, around the globe and that got me really interested about why why is it so and like it's very fascinating like i would uh, if tama could uh see what got her into biography yeah i mean i agree with um, ben actually you know just stepping out of your houses and seeing how uh, different species are found in different areas itself you know I, for someone who's very curious like me it really got me um, thinking about why those patterns exist but there's another reason why i got interested in biogeography and that's humans I was very fascinated by uh, human biogeography you know as I was an undergrad I remember reading a book on human evolution and I was if I can use the word gobsmacked because there are all these different species of humans who are no longer with us right Hom- hominids and they have distinct geographical distributions they have these distinct dispersal events and introgression all of which we can also think about with any other animal or plant or creature right so for me it started from there very anthropocentric uh curiosity about why are there so many species of hominins and why were they distributed the way they were um and from there expanding it to um you know generally the uh, all other uh, creatures on earth i think that's where for me it started wow that is so interesting i mean it's a very different place from like where i have i started getting interested in biogeography i think i was i saw a map of mammal distribution around the world and it was like i, mean, I think particularly carnivores yeah i think all of us come from very the very background as to why we are interested in biogeography so uh, now the i mean the next question comes is why is it important to uh, study biogeography today i mean uh, there are uh, like i would like to talk about it in uh, light of contributions of alexander von humboldt and alfred russel wallace because we know that they kind of laid the foundation to like today's biogeography modern biogeography as we know it uh, uh, could tama could you uh, explain a bit yeah um why i mean the first part of the question was why do we have to study biogeography right what's the relevance of it and i think uh, ben really did uh, uh very succinctly put it when he said that you know in this era of anthropocene uh, and climate change you know and all the other things that are happening uh we need to understand how species respond right and one of the ways in which they respond is by altering their ranges you know shifting habitat you know moving along with these climate profiles uh and we know that this is not something that species have not done before there is historical precedence you know earth's climate has changed in the past things have happened in the past and species and biodiversity have responded to those changes and biogeography allows you to kind of look at those changes like look at those responses try and understand what drives species distribution patterns and how those patterns have changed over time so i think therefore biogeography becomes really important um it today's time when we think about you know future for like forecasting where species will be and things like that um and like you said uh both humboldt and wallace have been like um uh if we can excuse the patriarchy for a minute you know the fathers of biogeography um you know founding pillars of uh, biogeography to be honest and both of them are very different uh but also very similar in some ways they lived in different times right um they were exploring uh, both of them explored south america but very different parts of south america um humboldt never made it to asia despite many attempts to come to the himalayas he was never really granted permission uh, by the east india company to uh, come to asia but um wallace did spend a lot of time in southeast asia and a lot of his insights also come from that time he spent in uh, island southeast asia right um they were similar in the sense that both of them were immensely curious right and they had uh especially humboldt was a polymath he was good at so many things right he was a trained geologist he was a naturalist uh he understood uh, anatomy he did a lot of things and that allowed him to kind of bring very disparate things together and to see this commonness that existed in patterns and you know in things that he was seeing in nature 
uh, which was very similar to how I think Wallace was looking at the world. He was able to make these connections. He was seeing butterflies. He was seeing birds. He was seeing mammals. He was seeing them across these very um, interesting geographic spaces, which are these different islands of different sizes, you know, isolated from each other to varying degrees. And to put all of that together and come up with a coherent idea of what determines species distributions, I think that for me is what makes Wallace and um, Humboldt stand out, you know, uh, and so many things that they pointed out uh, in their work. Uh, right? We have proof to say when we've studied, 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 and now we have evidence to say that what they said with what little information they had was actually spot on. Um, so I think um, that way Humboldt and his expeditions, especially in South America, you know, he traveled across the Amazon forest, he uh, climbed uh, the Andes, and he did meticulous measurements of both environment and uh, biodiversity, not just focusing on the natural. He was not just a collector, but he was also taking all kinds of measurements. You know, he was interested in volcanism. He was interested in species distributions. He was interested in temperature profiles. He was really prolific. Wallace, on the other hand, you know, uh, was meticulous in the kind. He was a collector mostly, you know, and a lot of his collections uh, actually sustained him, you know, that collection sustained him. And so he was very careful in actually going out and collecting different species. And he had a keen eye. He was able to observe all these species, the minute differences. And I think all of that um, aided in his conclusions. And his were really important, right? Because he is uh, credited as the co um, whatever discoverer of the theory of evolution by natural selection. Uh, but also importantly, he was one of the few who, who spoke about the role of geography in species distribution mm. patterns, which is the foundation for biogeography. One of the first people to talk about how geography and you know isolation and uh, differences across islands actually drove uh, speciation perhaps, although he didn't use that word. It's amazing like how they pictured the larger patterns that exist in the globe, like without having the means of modern science that we have today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, with that, I would, uh, I think the follow up question that I have is of, uh, what, what do you think are the major historical and climatic events that have shaped species distribution and assemblages in the present times? Okay, um, that is like, it has to be maybe a course, right? Because right from when the earth originated to today, there have been consistently so many climatic uh, and geographic thing patterns, I mean, water processes that have shaped, uh, shaped species distribution. But maybe I can take two examples. Um, and because you said uh, current species distributions, I'll take maybe two things that have happened relatively recently um, in biogeographic terms, right? Um, if you think about climatic events that shaped one of the one of the major events that has shaped species distribution patterns that we see today across the world, especially in the northern hemisphere, is the Pleistocene glaciation events, right? Um, and if you uh, know this already, just bear with me. These Pleistocene glaciation events have been a series of uh, glacial and interglacial periods. The glacial periods are longer than the interglacial periods. Uh, this is when the Earth. You know, the, the polar ice caps that we have in the Arctic and Antarctic, they increase in their extent. They cover major parts of the northern um, latitudes. Southern latitudes don't have so many continents. Just to, the, to the extent that where I'm sitting right now, 15,000 years ago, was under one kilometer of ice. Right? That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, there was that a big extent of glacier, right? Most of what we think of as Canada today and northern parts of North America, including like Indiana and all these places, were under ice, right? Including a lot, wow. large part of northern Europe. Yeah. Uh, and so when you have these very large ice, and there have, there have been a series of this, so it's a cyclical process that has set in uh, in the last two million years or three million years. Um, and the last of these cycles had its maximum extent of that uh, glaciers around 18,000 years ago, right? So it's called the last glacial maxima. That was the time when the glaciers were at the most, um, uh, the largest extent, yeah? And as uh, Ben was saying, they covered a large portion of the Northern Hemisphere, 
right? What that meant is that A, they locked up a lot of the water. So the sea levels went down globally. So today, islands in island Southeast Asia that are distinct islands were actually connected. Some of these islands were connected as one landmass, right? Because they were exposed. Um, that was the consequences everywhere else. But also as water got locked up in ice, the earth became drier, right? Uh, but also physically, there was not much space left in the Northern Hemisphere, which meant that species had to move down into what are called this climate refugia, right? For example, in, uh, um, in Europe, we know that the Mediterranean region, you know, Italy, parts of France, uh, maybe some parts of Spain, the uh, Iberian Peninsula, all of these places basically acted as refugia because the, uh, the ice sheets didn't reach there. It was still probably warmer, right? So a lot of species reached these uh, refugia and uh, were found in these refugia, right? Uh, and subsequent to this ice uh, melting, right? So over time, the Earth's, um, Earth reached the interglacial period, the temperature started increasing again, right? That's what we call as the Holocene. Uh, that's about 10,000 years ago, we entered the Holocene, but between say 17,000 to 10,000, there was a gradual warming of the Earth. So the ice sheets retreated, land became available, and you see that species recolonized uh, parts of say Northern Europe or uh, Northern North America, from these glacial refugia. And if you actually look at patterns of distribution, and especially if you look at phylogeography, right, which is uh, the um, a genetic, um, what do you say, um, the evidence in our genes of these movements of geographic distributions, if you look at these various species of plants and animals in Europe, you'll find this uh, evidence for this uh, recolonization from these uh, glacial refugia. So that's one, example of uh, recent climatic events having shaped uh, geographic distributions, yeah? Um, talking of geological events, there's one which is one of my favorite, which is called the Great American Biotic Interchange, uh, right? So it's basically, for a long time, North America as a continent was se separated from South America as a continent, right? South America was last connected to uh, the southern continents of Australia and Antarctica and had a lot of marsupials, right? North America had a lot of placental mammals, right? And for a long time, they had been isolated. But starting about 10 million years ago, right, uh, there, was, there, there was the formation of the Panama land bridge, right? It took some time, right? Uh, but the process is believed to have started about maybe 8 to 10 million years ago. What that allowed is interchange of mammal species and of diversity in general across South and North America, right? And what we know today for various reasons that we don't have to get into right now is that that interchange was not entirely uh, symmetrical. So you have a lot more of North American lineages that uh, entered South America and successfully established themselves, whereas fewer South American lineages actually made it to North America, right? But there's an example of a geological process, right? The formation of a land bridge due to the movement of tectonic plates. Uh, that had led to the, you know, uh, exchange of um, entire taxa across two different landmasses that had otherwise been separated for millions and millions of years. So, yeah, two examples. Of <laughs> yeah, there can be so many, but these two are, I think, very important in terms of like, yeah, Ben wouldn't be sitting there if there was... <laughs> uh, <laughs> the glacier the event didn't happen. <laughs> uh, uh, so the next question is for Ben. Uh, do you think there can be a broad categorization of factors? I mean, there, I know there are lots of factors which affect each taxa to be present in a certain area. But can you, I mean, uh, do you think there is a broad factors which, uh, which affect distribution of various taxa in terms of uh, their ranges, their occurrences? Yeah. So, so there's there's been many kind of classifications that have been proposed uh, for the the because it's it's the, the short answer is it's complicated, right? There's lots of there's lots of reasons why a species lives here but not there, but saying it's complicated isn't very helpful. Um, so the one one kind of uh, conceptual um, explanation that I think is is nice is it divides factors into to three groups, and so one group is the is whether a place is kind of whether an organism has the capacity to disperse to a place uh, and that kind of takes into account the, the the history 
like Priya was just talking about, like the longer term history that sets the stage for what we see now. So for example, you know, a, a bird that lives in Vancouver, uh, it's just going to have a hard time dispersing across the Pacific Ocean. So something in Asia might just, it might be unable to live there just because it can't get there. Or, or just like Priya was talking about with the biotic interchange between North and South America, a lot of these mammals from North America could live in South America and some vice versa, but for a long time, they just couldn't get there. So that the first one there is, is dispersal barriers. And then a second one is relates to climate, whether the climate is suitable for that species or not. And then a third one is whether the, whether the interactions with species, other species, uh, mean that that place is suitable for the species or not. So the three categories are, are, are called the dispersal or the movement. Uh, and the second is the abiotic or the climate. And the third is the biotic or the species interactions. And so this is this has been used in a lot of the species distribution modeling uh, world to think about why species live where they do, uh, and I think it's that's a helpful uh, helpful set of three kind of categories of factors when you when you think about any particular case. It does get more complicated, and, and you start to be like, wait, is this? And, and they and they interact and stuff. But but broadly, conceptually, I think that's a helpful way to think about it. Uh huh. Yeah. When we are looking at a large scale i think these are the patterns which come out i mean if you look at it from a snapshot view these are the patterns which come out of that uh, so continuing from this i think i will um, i mean I, I i have followed your research i uh, so uh, so what do you think are the limitations of bird species ranges from a biogeographic yeah. standpoint yeah, and, and so, so all three of those factors will be important that I just mentioned. So, so mm -hmm. the ability to, to get there, uh, to, to disperse to an area, and the climate, and the species interactions. And so one thing about studying birds uh, is that they have wings, so that their capacity to move is pretty good. Um, and I've often studied birds along mountain slopes. And one reason that I've done that is because I think for birds, for birds on a mountain slope, we can ignore dispersal constraints. If a bird lives only at the bottom but not the top, or only the top but not the bottom, the bird could access. I mean, even on a, on a even an individual bird could fly up or down the mountain, let alone over generations. So, so I feel like an advantage to mobile organisms along elevational gradients along mountain slopes is that you can ignore dispersal. So you can just, you can kind of focus on whether the climate's appropriate uh, and whether there's interactions among species and competition and predation and mutualisms and parasitism and things that, that prevent them. And, and one of the things I've, and so I've been totally fascinated by this, because especially in tropical mountains, as many of you are familiar with, a lot of, a lot of species, including birds, live in really narrow slices of the mountainside. Like you, you, you know, with lots of birds that they don't live at the bottom, they only live in the middle, they don't live at the top, or they only live at the top, but not the middle or the bottom or, or any combination. And again, these are organisms with wings, they could easily, individuals could easily in an hour fly higher or lower, but we don't see them there. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's totally fascinating to me what, what, what restricts species to these narrow ranges. And some of my recent research has, has highlighted the, so the traditional explanation is like, is, is climate, that it's kind of a Goldilocks scenario, that species live because it's warmer at the bottom of the mountain and it gets colder, colder, colder as you get to the top. And the idea is that species kind of specialize on a certain climate that is, is the right climate for them. Um, and that, that may well be often true for, for many species, but some of my recent research has, has provided some positive evidence that species interactions are really important, that, that one reason why a bird might live only in the middle is uh, because it competes with the species that lives lower down and that they each kind of prevent each other from living in each other's zones. And so that's something that I, I'm, I'm really interested in is how these species interactions shape the patterns that we see, that obviously climate is super, super important uh, but I think the species interactions are, are often the, the way that uh, are often really important and they, they link to climate uh, as well. Um, but mm -hmm. I think these species interactions are, are often really important for explaining why species live where they do. Uh, ben, I just, uh, I mean, while I was uh, 
I mean, we are talking about competition. I was thinking about does any kind of facilitation also work? Yeah. So, so, so people talk about this a lot with plants. Uh, that there's a mm. lot of facilitation, especially in in more temperate regions at high elevations. That's a very stressful environment for plants, uh, and we know from uh, observations, from comparative studies, and from experiments that a lot of high elevation plant species uh, have these facilitative relationships. Where if you were to remove one of the plant species, a lot of the other plant species can't persist. Uh, because it's a harsh environment and, and the fact that you have some plants growing creates the microclimates that let other plants live. So, so we know, that, so, so I've really focused on competition in birds, um, but, but we know that, uh, that positive interactions can be really important, certainly for plants. Positive interactions mm -hmm. are also going to be important for birds. We have lots of examples of mixed species flocks. Uh, mm -hmm. Where, where birds that participate in these flocks uh, gain some benefit, um, we, we don't have, I would say we don't have uh, super compelling evidence that that really limits the ranges, but I think it's, it's got to be true uh, at, at some level. So, so while I focus on competition, I, I don't think that's the only interaction that's going to be important to these sorts of, uh, of, of, of factors that limit species ranges. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I think these interactions are in a way dynamic as well. Sometimes a species which is competing will uh, facilitate in uh, another context. So these uh, interactions yeah. are very... So, so they're very dynamic. Uh, they're dynamic in the course of seasons when there's when you're in a seasonal mm -hmm. environment, like in the Himalaya, which, which I, was, I was chatting at the start. So I, I've never been to India. I've never been to the Himalaya. And I, I've done a lot of my work in, in the tropical Andes, uh, which don't have much seasonality. But one of the things that's so interesting about the Himalaya is the, the massive seasonal movements of birds. Almost all the birds migrate elevationally. And so there's mm -hmm. some, some colleagues are really interested in that. And it's quite plausible that the competition that's important for the birds is in the winter. In the summer, yeah. they might not really be competing with each other at all. There might be enough food. It just doesn't matter. Uh, but in the winter might be when the competition is. So, so these, these are very dynamic. And, and, they, and to take the longer term view of that, that Priya was talking about, I mean, species, uh, they might be interacting with a certain set of species today. That doesn't mean those were the same species they were interacting with 10,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago or a million years ago. And obviously with, with humans moving species around now, we've supercharged that process. But these are very dynamic processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I think we can go on talking about it and find like new aspects to this. I mean, uh, so I would like, I'd like to ask the next question to Priya. Uh, um, why, uh, you ha why is there such a high speciation rate in tropics and uh, temperate regions in, uh, globally and in Asia? And is that why we find such diverse assemblages of species in these areas? Yeah, so a um, very good question because a lot of, that's the, how do I say, it? that's been one of the reasons why people have studied biogeography, right? To explain mm -hmm. diversity that we find these differences or what is called as a latitudinal gradient, where you have a lot more diversity in the tropics and it decreases as you go towards the poles. Um, and there, there have been a lot of explanations given over the last uh, few years by you know, different groups of people. The explanations can range from really large spatial and temporal scales to slightly more, you know, smaller regional uh, spatial scales and more recent temporal scales. Um, but one of the, but there are a few things that seem to matter. First of all, time, right? Uh, the earth itself has been through multiple climatic regimes. So there was a time about 700 million years ago when the earth was what was called a snowball earth. Every inch of earth was just covered by glaciers, right? But there was also mm -hmm. a time point uh, when Earth was mostly tropical in nature, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which meant that people have argued that tropics or the tropical sort of environmental regime is much older and most species have evolved to live in that kind of an environmental regime. If you think about, I talked about the Pleistocene glaciation events, right? So that's been uh, in uh, place let's say, uh, in the Earth's climatic uh, cycle for the last three million years or so. So in that time, temperate regions have become more prominent, you know, spatially, uh, 
have expanded in some ways. Uh, so a lot of people have also argued that temperate regions are newer than tropical regions, right? More relatively more recent than the tropical regions. And so it's possible that many of the tropical taxa have actually diverged or diversified to occupy these temperate regions. So one of the explanations could just be time, right? The age of these different regions. But there have also been other explanations which include things like the amount of energy and water that is available in the tropics. So tropics are not limited by energy and water, whereas temperate regions are limited by energy, which in turn trickles down. So you know you have lesser primary productivity, you have more seasonality in primary productivity that can therefore support maybe uh, lesser diversity. So that's one hypothesis as well. Um, there's also uh, you know history, like I said, time can be one region. Uh, some people have argued that speciation rates itself uh, can vary between temperate and uh, tropical regions, and sometimes linking it back to actually mutation rates, saying that perhaps mutation rates are higher in the tropics than in the temperate. I don't know if anybody has actually evidence, uh, has shown it through evidence, but there has been a lot of speculation that perhaps even mutation rates may be higher in the tropics than in the temperate regions. Definitely the tropics have a lot more uh, niche space and you can pack in a lot more species because they have a lot more energy, uh, they're, uh, they're less seasonality. So throughout the year, you have a lot of these niches being stably present. So you could pack in a lot more species and also a lot more different uh, species to interact and compete with. But that stability uh, kind of allows for more diversity um, at long uh, temporal periods. So that's, that also could be an explanation. But in reality, it will be a combination of many things, right? That uh, tropics can act as both museums of diversity and cradles of diversity. You can have high speciation rates, but also lower extinction rates, right? And it's possible that temperate regions may have either relatively high speciation rates, but also higher extinction rates, right? So one of those yeah. two things, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, you think about just like, so I, I just said, okay, 15,000 years ago, where I'm sitting had a kilometer of ice. Okay, so like extinction rates were extremely high for any exactly. plant or animal mm -hmm. then. Yeah. Uh, and, and so anything that was like glaciated is, is like pretty clearly had, you know, plants and animals did not survive. And, and, and like Priya was saying, that didn't just happen once, that happened repeatedly. Uh, and, and so there's, it's very difficult to study, but this idea that mm -hmm. there's, there's variation in extinction rates is, seems intriguing to me. It's very hard to study though. Yeah. We do yeah. have it's from phylogenetic trees, right? But they remain estimates. We really can't actually go back and see those. Extinction is really yeah, hard. That, that, uh, that, that, time, is that, time, that time travel machine that uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're working on. <laughs> yeah, we definitely need that, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, from Ben's research, I mean, uh, you have found that trade evolution is faster in the temperate regions, though, than tropics. I mean, how do you explain that in light of the uh, the conversation we just had regarding spe uh, more speciation in the tropics or maybe uh, uh, younger uh, species? I mean, uh, younger species are present in the temperate regions. Yeah. So, so the so, so one question that I was interested in is just like, where is evolution fastest on Earth? Mm. Like, like is. Like, is there a biogeography to how fast evolution has been in the recent past? And of course, the answer is it's complicated, but, but some of the work that I've done and other people have done has said, okay, it seems like in general, temperate species have had faster recent rates of, of trade evolution than tropical species. And we think the explanation for why that might be so is, is what we were just talking about is that Look, if, if, if this was under ice 15,000 years ago, uh, where I am, and then that ice melts, and then you have basically like open space, and you don't have very many species, uh, that, it, it, that that kind of sets the conditions when you don't have many species and you have lots of space, those are the conditions when you can see really rapid evolution. I mean, even in the Darwin's finches, which are on the equator, uh, so it, it kind of breaks the latitude thing, but it's the same basic idea that these are very kind of low species richness environments. When you only have a couple species, they can evolve in many different ways. Whereas if you have already have hundreds of species, maybe each individual species is a little bit constrained in how it can 
which the, the kind of directions that it can evolve in its traits. And so that's, that's what, I mean, that, that, that's one explanation that, that I can give here. Um, mm. But I think, I think it's quite plausible that, uh, that places with fewer species might in general have faster, the capacity for faster, uh, faster rates of evolution. But it's like saying that there is more uh, space for adaptive uh, radiations, right? Because there is that yeah. uh, trait space available to expand into. Is exactly. that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and also you can think about like I was thinking about this for species interactions, and 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 specifically I was thinking about this with with birds who suffer nest predation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're a bird and you only have one, you only have a snake that comes and eats your nest. Okay, that's really strong selection to evolve anti-predator behaviors or tactics against one predator. And you can imagine, okay, the bird could put its nest somewhere that's hard for the snake to get. It could use something chemical. But if you have a bird that's getting its nest eaten by 30 different types of predators that use all different strategies, like what are the options available for that if the bird evolves an effective strategy against snakes, maybe it just makes it more vulnerable to one of the other predators. And so this, 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 that, that kind of gets at the idea I was just saying, which is that when you have lots of species doing lots of things, it might be, and exactly like what you're saying about kind of adaptive radiations, that there might be just less, uh, less kind of directions that evolution, that, that selection can, can, uh, can, can drive trait evolution um, because there's just there's already successful species doing their own thing that that you uh, that the species kind of don't want. Uh, you can't help but think of evolution in these like wanting things. But but where where selection that that brought a species closer to other species starts to have negative consequences. So so that might be one reason. People have argued the reverse too. Interestingly, so it's 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 uh, I, I might be totally wrong here, but that's the way that I've been thinking about it. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, when I read these two re uh, papers, I was thinking that okay, these seem like a little contradictory. But when you uh, explain this, that this makes sense. Yeah. Well, I well, mean, and, and and also there's so so the longer term diversification rates are are higher in the tropics because look, mm -hmm. we go out there and there's more species in the tropics. Like those species have an evolutionary mm -hmm. history. Parsing it into speciation and extinction gets complicated, but clearly, like the longer term diversification rates, and so that's the other thing I should say too: the, the shorter term, the shorter term evolutionary rates. So, like we have some of the youngest species in the world are close to where I'm standing because they're in lakes that only formed after the glaciers left, and mm -hmm. and they went from one species to two in the last twelve thousand years. So really fast speciation, but are we confident that those species are going to persist for 5 million years, 10 million years? Pro probably not. Whereas, mm -hmm. so, so, so in the temperate yeah. zone, one, another ex possible explanation is that maybe evolution is really fast in the temperate zone and in these low species richness environments, but extinction yeah. might also be really fast. So that like the big picture view is that diversity has always been formed, but it doesn't accumulate quite as much. Uh, following up to this uh, uh, discussion, do you think, I mean, temperate and tropical, uh, how do you think temperate and tropical species uh, will react to climate change? Yeah, so, so this is this is something that, that I think I've been really interested in, lots of people have been interested in. And, and the work that I've done for birds along mountain slopes, it's getting warmer. The idea is that, okay, it gets warmer, birds should, should, should over time move higher on the mountain. The same idea is true for latitudes, that over time species should move towards the poles. But latitudes like really long distances and mountains are shorter, so they're a little bit simpler. Um, and so we, so this is a widespread idea, right? That, that, okay, with warming, we should see species move up the mountain, like they're riding an escalator. And we're worried about it because for high elevation species, they have nowhere higher to move. So for them, it's an escalator to extinction. Um, and so this idea has been, been out there. Uh, when I, when I compiled all the evidence, like in the temperate zone, yes, species are moving up, but only a little, not as much as you would predict given the temperature increases. Whereas in the tropics, species seem to be more or less tracking their temperature, like it, that it gets, it gets warmer such that the isotherm on the mountain moves up 100 meters. Well, species 
in general, move up 100 meters as well. Uh, whereas in the temperate zone, if the isotherm moves up 100 meters, species seem to move up about 30 or 40 meters. Um, so so there are, there's these differences. Uh, why, those, why we see that pattern uh, is something that I think uh, is both really interesting and I thought I had a good explanation. And it was about tropical species being really specialized to temperature. Um, but some of the recent work I've done it makes me wonder if that's maybe not what's happening. And it's maybe more about kind of high species richness has these, yeah, I, I have these ideas where, where like high species richness means that temperature becomes more important uh, because these, these species interactions are ultimately mediated by temperature. Um, whether that has any validity or not, I'm not sure. But, but the pattern is clear that in the tropics, these species are, are mm -hmm. shifting their ranges. They're following temperature. They're tracking temperature a little bit better uh, than in the temperate zone. Yeah, this is really interesting to, I mean, wonder why <laughs> these patterns exist. I mean, uh, the, the next question I would like to follow uh, for Tamma is like, uh, like animals occupying the same distributional range, do you think that has to do more with them coming from the same area or having same, shared or same ancestry? Yeah, so I think um, this is uh, I think this is based off of the work that I did in the Indian subcontinent. So I'll maybe just give a little bit of a background for that. Mm -hmm. So um, when you look at the Indian subcontinent, right? So we are really at the juxtaposition uh, in the middle of this transition from West Asia to Southeast Asia and East Asia. So we're going from this very semi-arid landscape uh, into so we're in the middle. So the eastern a lot of the eastern parts of India are high rainfall, high temperature. Uh, tropical regions, whereas the western parts of India are drier, semi-arid to arid, right? We have the Thar Desert. Uh, and of course, then we have the Himalayas, which almost act like a gate for the rest of the uh, Indian subcontinent uh, and mediate what species can come in from the Palearctic region. So in a way, India is quite unique uh, that way, biogeographically. Who makes it into the Indian subcontinent and who makes it out is mediated either through oceanic dispersal or through dispersal across these mountain ranges, right? Um, of course, we also had our own species when we moved away from uh, Africa. But um, so especially with mammals, it becomes interesting because a lot of the mammal evolution, the radiation of mammals was happening when India was floating as a, a, a you know, island per se uh, from Africa to collide with Asia. So it was kind of isolated for a few million years. Right. And a lot of these modern uh, mammalian groups were radiating in parts of Asia and Europe and parts of Africa. And maybe some of them hadn't actually made it to the Indian subcontinent. So then it became interesting. What is the story of the assemblage of mammals within the Indian subcontinent? And we were very curious about this. And we realized very early on that we have these contributions from each of these biogeographic realms, right? We do have Palearctic type species. We have the lynx. Uh, we have, you know, uh, a lot, you have marmots in um, Himalayas. We have a lot of species that are Palearctic. If you had to actually, uh, if you classified species based on where their um, lineage uh, owes its origin to, then we can actually classify Indian mammals into those that have a very oriental distribution or Asian distribution, those that have a distinctive West Asian distribution, those that have a Palearctic distribution, and those that are in the B, right? Uh, and what we found was that uh, most of the species that we had classified, right, uh, as Western or, you know, uh, or as species that have a biogeographic origin west of India, actually simply occupied regions that are semi arid and arid. Right? So they almost were like they were tracking their biogeographic climatic space. Right? And those that we had classified as uh, Eastern species, we call them Western, Eastern, Northern to avoid any kind of uh, controversy. So those that we had called Eastern species were largely found tracking the wet tropical type of forests. Right? And those mm -hmm. that we had called Northern were largely limited to Palearctic regimes, which is in the, uh, in the Himalayas. Right? Um, and a lot of our endemics are only in peninsular India, far away from any of these edges. Yeah, that's where the diversity mm. was highest. We don't know if it's because the peninsular India has a kind of unique combination of environments. You know, it is semi-arid, but also has pockets of old tropical forests. So we don't know if that 
uh, led to some sort of uh, endemism or if it is just that endemics had a chance to become endemic far away from these places where exchange was happening with the other biogeographic zones. Um, but yeah, so to answer your question, uh, in this case, in the case of my study, phylogeny and biogeographic origin were kind of correlated. Right? But you can imagine a situation where maybe where you're from determines where you are, right? In terms of your species distributions, uh, because you're not you're constrained somehow by that phylogeny, right? A species that whose lineage uh, has evolved in say the tropical environments and uh, mm -hmm. cannot suddenly go and survive in a temperate environment, right? You can't take a, a pitta from an Indian forest and throw it in the Saharan desert and expect it to somehow do well. It will not because it's not, it, it's phylogenetically constrained. Um, so, yeah, that's- Yeah, that, uh, as, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I didn't, I didn't know that there were links in Marmot in the Himalayas. That's amazing. I, I suddenly feel like maybe I overstretched links. No, 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 no. Yeah. no I, uh, I, now I'm confused. I don't know. I, Marmots I, I for sure. We have him out in Marmots. Marmots. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. But yeah. it made me think that because because what you're talking about is that like it's hard for species to kind of evolve the set of traits that let them, you know, colonize totally new environments. Like in general, that is true, right? For, for plants and animals, it's hard for them to like, you know, come from a, a group that lives in the rainforest and all of a sudden live in the desert. But I think I think sometimes we forget that because that's just that's just true in general. I think sometimes we forget that because we're humans and we're amazing at colonizing different environments. Um, yeah, and, and as I was, as I, I don't know if I had ever explicitly made that connection, but like humans were so good at colonizing new environments that could be so different environmentally. Um, but, and obviously some plants and animals are able to do that, but in general, that's a huge challenge. That's impossible uh, for 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 most plants and animals. And so there's a big legacy of history and phylogeny, like you were talking about. Yeah, I, I meant to say Pallas's cat, Pallas's cat. I don't know how you call it. That. Yeah, no, yeah. Oh, that, that one's that one's so yeah, cool. That's but yeah, but it, but it, but it's still sure. it's 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 from that from that group. Yeah, yeah. yeah the new one of the old paleontic. Yeah. Wow, like I think we can go on asking you guys questions and like I yeah. I keep having more questions, but our time is coming to an end. So before, uh, after the, uh, uh, like I would uh, ask each of you to, uh, I mean, tell us about some of your interesting findings from field and then we will move to the questions. I mean, if Tama can go first. Interesting findings from my research. Is that what you asked? Yeah. 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 Um, I think uh, for me, it was basically what we had studied in the Himalayas, right? And before me, people had been studying bird biogeography in the Himalayas, basically using phylogeny. And what a fascinating tale, because <laughs> we know that, um, I mean, this is, this is a paper that I remember from many years ago. I'm sure there are more recent papers I haven't kept up with the literature. But uh, for example, we know that... Uh, you can think of the Himalayas as either, you know, mountains and islands generally are hotbeds of evolution, right? There's a lot of speciation happening there. We expect a lot of in situ speciation to happen. But contrary to expectations, for both mammals, uh, which is the work that I had done, and birds that, you know, Trevor Price and some of his collaborators had done, we actually found that there wasn't so much evidence for some groups of mammals and some group of birds. Let me just make that very clear there wasn't so much in situ speciation happening in the Himalayas. It looked like actually there was a lot of immigration into the Himalayas, which is counterintuitive because everywhere else in the world, mountains are like, uh, you know, they're driving um, evolution because they have these steep elevational gradients. Um, that's not necessarily, again, true for all taxa, right? We did find, I think some other group worked on lizards and they found that there was a lot of in situ speciation in the Himalayas, perhaps because birds and mammals are not so dispersal limited like Ben was talking about in the beginning. And perhaps because they are slightly more relatively recent um, evolutionary uh, lineages, they are quite young, right? Both mammals and birds. Uh, maybe it's uh, because of that, uh, but I don't know that, that for me was very fascinating. Yeah. And, and the, yeah. the, the last thing that I'll, I'll mention, I've, um, so, yeah, you're asking, oh, like, what's what's something I want to share? 
Uh, I think the, the one thing I want to share and leave, leave everyone with uh, is the importance of citizen science or community science, um, which, which I, it's just something that I think is, is really cool. And, and some of the studies I've done recently have really drawn on specifically eBird, which if you're into birds, hopefully you, you know about and maybe even use. Um, but but it's, it's a really phenomenal time to be studying things related to biogeography, things related to where species live and where they don't and why. Um, because some of the things that, you know, like Humboldt and Wallace wondered about, like they had to physically, Wallace had to physically go from island to island to island to island to island to island to gather data himself. And then obviously over the decades, like other collectors did that and then maybe it could go to museums. But now the, the, the huge number of interested people in the world who are just interested in plants and animals and go out and take, like, I'll go for a walk later this morning and I'll submit my little checklist to eBird of the birds that I see on my walk. And, you know, 70,000 people across the world are going to do something similar today. And so we're going to know where the birds are at 70,000 different places. And so the, the amount of data is just amazing. And, and India is, 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 is huge into eBird. It's, it's, it's totally astounding to me. And I think it's both very cool from a research perspective, because it's a tremendous amount of data to be able to study things at scales that we previously just couldn't even think about studying. And I think it's really cool culturally in that it gets more people paying attention to the environment and participating actively in things because they like to, because they like it, because they get something out of it. But it also makes people, uh, ties people, connects people to the animals that they're watching and then you start to say, oh, you know, things have changed season to season or year to year. And you start to get interested in that. And they start to be like neighbors to you instead of just something that you don't interact with. And the beauty of that is that you can do that in the city. You can do that in the countryside. You can do that at home. You can do it while you travel. And so, so I, I'm really enthusiastic about these platforms like iNaturalist mm -hmm. and eBird to, to do citizen science and community science. I just think they're, they're really powerful and they're very cool. So yeah. you should all participate in that. It actually reminds me of a paper that one of my favorite papers is uh, from Cornell uh, that used the eBird data to kind of uh, uh, come up with these flyways across North and South America. That was such a cool paper. Let's yeah. all say at all, 2016. I remember yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but so, so just, just to give you some so be, things that we can do with the citizen science data, some of my studies have done this to, to, to look at elevational ranges in different mountains, including the Western Ghats and the Himalayas, um, uh, in, a, in a global analysis. But basically, you can take this information and basically what each little survey is doing is it's a little survey. And so you can combine those and make astounding maps of species um, that are in the resolution are just are beautiful. Uh, and, and you should, so you should, if you haven't seen these before, look it up, look up the eBird map for, for various Indian species and, and they'll, they'll exist and they're, and they're really, really good and they're really cool. Uh, and, and then all sorts of research applications come out of that. But at its core, it's being able to make really good maps of, of where species live uh, by having people that participate in it go do, you know, surveys again, because they like to pay attention to birds or, or because iNaturalist people like to take pictures of cool things they find and see what they are. Um, but but I, I, I just think that's, that's, that's one thing that's already very cool. And I think moving forward is just going to be more and more important to the to lots and lots of research, as well as kind of how society interacts with the environment. Yeah, I think having these platforms out there has made, I mean, global research a lot easier with, I mean, data out there, which you can access anytime and all thanks to the citizen scientists, I guess, <laughs> and the birders. And yeah, I think I should quickly get, get to the question section because there is very little time left. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to ask Tamma first. Why are there lesser Indian endemics, though a lot of varied landscapes are present in India and lies in the tropics? Okay, so when I said there were fewer endemics, I meant solely with respect to mammals, right? Uh, uh, and we were talking of endemics at the level of genera. I was not 
saying endemic species. We have very few endemic genera of mammals in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, a lot of the mammals in the Indian subcontinent at the level of the genera are also found elsewhere, either in the north or east or west. Uh, let me just clarify that. Uh, India does have a lot of endemics when it comes to birds and especially to plants and uh, most importantly to species, uh, to lineages that are very old and that are dispersal limited, right? So for example, if you look at Janvi Joshi's work, uh, on centipedes or you know uh, other things, you will find that we have Western Ghats was a refugia, right? Uh, and these are species that we carried uh, when we moved from Africa um, into uh, you know and collided with Asia. So when I say there are a few Indian endemics, I only mean at the generic level um, in mammals at the level of the genera. Yeah. And right. I'm sure you I, and I'm sure you have more than Canada, which probably has. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You weren't covered by an inch of water, kilometer of snow. <laughs> uh, the next question is for Ben. Uh, it is, is there a model or matrix of publication that uses competitiveness of bird species, adaptability, etc., that can be used to look at effects on range distribution by climate change? Yeah, so so that's a great question. So it's it's about like, okay, is there... Do we have, has someone put out or either the ideas or the evidence about how how bird kind of yeah, competitiveness or adaptability or something affects responses to, to climate change? Uh, and and not, not specifically for kind of species interactions. So there's a general idea that species that are more generalists might be more flexible and might be better able to uh, persist in the face of change or even benefit from, from change. Um, in the in the context of climate change, we don't necessarily have a lot of evidence that that is is true. Um, but but I think in the context of kind of general landscapes where humans have changed the landscape a huge amount, and so like urban areas, like this is brand new mm -hmm. in the history of life on Earth. This is an environment that has never existed before. Brand new environment, cities, and we do see right the the species that that are able to colonize cities and thrive in cities uh, are species that are pretty generalist, that are pretty adaptable. And there's all sorts of fascinating things like for birds, species that tend to thrive in cities tend to have bigger brains than species that aren't able to colonize cities. Uh, and so, so I think there's things like that are, are, are really um, uh, provide some evidence for I think what that question is getting at. Uh, but but I would say more in a more in a kind of a urban gradients and cities and, and human dominated land use context, as opposed to say, you know, quote unquote pristine landscapes where nonetheless there are changes happening, including climate changes and species are changing their distributions. But in those sort of quote pristine landscapes, I think we we don't have much uh, evidence. We we don't understand why some species are changing their ranges more than others. Whereas in like a city context, we, we, we do have pretty good evidence that things like generalism and, and brain size are important. Thanks, Ben. Uh, the next question is for Tamma. Uh, can the oriental tropics draw parallels from biogeographical research from the neotropics uh, or are the results to the same hypothesis completely different? I think we can draw parallels in the sense um, that in terms of the methods we use, in terms of uh, how we investigate patterns, of course, but if you, but the processes themselves, although might be similar, might result in very different patterns in these different places, right? Like when, like Ben and I were saying, um, it's possible that speciation rates are higher both in the tropics and in the temperate regions, but maybe extinction rates are higher in the temperate, but not in the tropics, right? So uh, mm -hmm. in a way they're not parallel. There are some aspects that are similar because at the end of the day, it's it's one earth. They're the same mechanisms that are kind of driving these different uh, processes everywhere. But the extent to which these different processes assume importance becomes different. So we can use the same mm -hmm. approaches, but we have to be um, careful in how we interpret the results, I would assume. So um, results to the same hypotheses can be different, right? You can have very different hypotheses to begin with. Uh, because the uh, the underlying uh, 
physiology of organisms or the kind of stresses and selection pressures they're facing is slightly different uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to whether you're at the equator or whether you're you know close to the poles. So that would be my answer. Yeah. Ben, if you uh, have the, to add uh, as a sorry. temperate expert. Okay. Right, sorry. Uh, the next question is for Ben. Uh, it is, uh, it has been asked. Uh, uh, so uh, in relation to his comments on seasonal migration in the Himalayas, do the tropical Andes also receive a lot of migrants from North America and temperate mm. South America? If yes, does this excessively mean nat nature make studying species interactions very difficult? Does that mean the rate of speciation are decreasing in the tropics recently? What might happen in the next glacial period? This is a really long question. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Making, making predictions for the future too. Thanks for the question. Um, so the so so the so like the, the Himalayas, even the tropical Himalayas have have a lot of the birds that breed at high middle and high elevations will come down in the winter. Some mm -hmm. might come down a little bit, some might come down a lot, some might migrate further south in India, down to the Western Ghats, say. In the tropical Andes, we think, in general, a bird is born where it's born, it kind of lives right there, and it kind of dies right there. It doesn't, there's some species that do seasonal movements, but in general, a lot of birds are, even high elevation birds, are, are stay there year round. Um, then, the uh, the question about so okay migrants coming from north america or from southern south america to the andes there's there's a couple but there's not very many the which which i think is interesting because the migrants from north america we have lots of migratory birds they mostly go to central america and the caribbean some even then go all the way down to southern south america a couple go to the Amazon and the tropical Andes, but not very many. I think maybe because it's really there's already so many species and individuals there. It's hard for, you know, a million new insect eating small birds to just like show up and find food and, and persist. Um, but so, so I think those things are, are really uh, are fascinating to think about those, those sort of migrations. Yeah. I have a question. Can I please? Yeah. 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 So, um, so you said there are fewer species migrating to the Amazon, but many more that perhaps uh, go down south, right? Uh, could it be that because the Amazon is so different, it's tropical, it's environmentally yeah. different that they can't even as migrants can't really. Uh, so, so, so it could be some species still do migrate to the Amazon. And what's fascinating to me too is some of these birds that go to the Amazon at least a couple of the even insect eating birds that go to the Amazon, they don't just go to the Amazon and stay there for seven months and then come back, which is what they do if they go to like the forests in Mexico and Central America. A lot of them go to one place, stay there and then go back. Some of these ones in the Amazon, they move around the Amazon and, and maybe to track resources mm -hmm. uh, or, or they kind of go around the edge of the Amazon. But, but I think, I think the, Amazon, like places with really high species richness, like are hard to colonize. There's already a lot of species that are really good at living in a, that environment. It's hard for new species to just kind of show up and colonize there, uh, even if it's just a seasonal uh, seasonal shift. Um, and, but yeah, I think that's the 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 kind of the how these communities change over time because all communities do change over the course of, of the year, at least for birds, um, is, is really fascinating. And there, there are a couple other questions in there, but I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, I think we are getting a lot of questions because I, I mean, everybody had a lot of questions about <laughs> the species occurring in certain regions. I mean, yeah. I think I will only uh, I mean, ask one more question from Tamma and then close this session. Uh, so somebody has asked, uh, like, mm, like they, uh, I mean, they're not sure, but I mean, uh, why are uh, West, why are there more endemics in the Western Hearts than Himalayas? If yes, it depends so. on which group you're focusing on, right? Like I said, there are certain groups. Uh, which are dispersed and limited, but also very ancient lineages that perhaps uh, were present in the Indian subcontinent, even when India was part of 
uh, uh, the Gondwana land. Uh, so in those mm-hmm. cases, you can imagine that today they would be like really old endemics, right? Uh, but if you were to think about, say, birds or mammals or some more recent uh, taxa, maybe there are more endemics in the Western Ghats because of the isolation. Remember, Himalayas are still connected to all the other biogeographic realms around the Indian subcontinent, right? They are uh, connected to Palearctic, they're connected to the Western and the Eastern sides, whereas the Western Ghats all said and done are a mountain chain that are relatively far away from these um, this areas of contact that India has. So mm, I it, to make a gener- generalized statement that there are more Western, more endemics in the Western Ghats than Himalayas, I'm not sure uh, that's actually very true for uh, all taxa at all. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think there are more questions, but uh, I will, I mean, yeah, you can reach out to Tama or uh, Ben directly uh, through their email, or you can write uh, to us in uh, our outreach at the rate cwsindia.org. And yeah, it has been a really great session. Like, I feel like the biogeography is kind of the real world story of animals, why they are there, like, you look at the history and then you kind of try to predict what will happen in the future. It's really exciting and like, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think I got some of my questions answered today, but <laughs> I mean, a lot of, a lot more questions are there in my mind right now. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's, it, uh, it has been a really great session and I think, yeah, it's morning in Ben's uh, yeah, we, it was it was dark when I started. Now, 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 now I'm, my my son was woke up and was sitting next to me for a little bit. Now, now I'm gonna I'm gonna take off and get him get him out to school. Um, but, but yeah, th- th- thank you so much, Shreya and, and, and Tama. I'm gonna sign off. But yeah, you can like Shreya was saying, if uh, you can send me an email uh, if you have any further questions. And, and I yeah, this this was really fun to participate in for me. So so thanks to to both of you and everyone in the audience. Thank you so much, Ben. It was thank really you. fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Priya, for taking time out. And like, it was so yeah. great talking to you. <laughs> yeah, same here, Shreya. Thank you so much for organizing this. It was fun. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye.